Freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So To Speak, the free speech podcast brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights in education. Welcome back to So To Speak, the free speech podcast, where every other week for six years now, actually, we've taken an uncensored look at the world of free expression through personal stories and candid conversations. I am your host, as always, Nico Perino. And today we're discussing the concept of academic freedom. Academic freedom, it's the general idea, I guess, that academics should have the freedom to seek out the truth wherever it may lead them, and that they should maintain the corollary freedom to share their findings with the general public, their academic peers, and their students. Now, admittedly, that's my very personal, very rough definition of academic freedom. Pithy definitions of the phrase and the concept are hard to find. However, over the years, organizations such as the American Association of University Professors and FIRE, along with, to a certain extent, the legal system, have more thoroughly defined the contours of that freedom and its limits. However, our guests on today's show argue that the popular conception of academic freedom has become too widely interpreted and too closely connected with the related, although not the same, freedom of speech. They have a new book due out next Tuesday, April 26th, that lays out their vision for academic freedom and why the leading organizations in America associated with it, including the one I work for, have gotten the concept wrong. The book is It's Not Free Speech, Race, Democracy, and the Future of Academic Freedom, and its authors are Penn State Professor Michael Barabe and Portland State Professor Jennifer Ruth. Professor Barabe and Ruth, welcome on to the show. Thanks so much for having us. So I think... To dive right in, we should take a look at the past and the present. So how do you see academic freedom being interpreted and applied over the years? And Professor Barabe, well, let's just start with you. Uh, sure. I, if, with Jennifer's permission, I was going to take that one anyway. Um, because I've also been doing another deep dive into this for another reason, not another book. Um, but it started in the United States uh, in 1915 with the uh, AAUP's Declaration of Principles on academic freedom, and that was then superseded in 1940 by what is now the Statement of, the statement of Principles. And there's a key difference between the two. The 1915 statement had a whole bunch of clauses about uh, the dangers of indoctrinating students, especially immature students. And over the course of the next 25 years, it was increasingly felt by um, leading administrators that this was infantilizing. And if you go back to 1915, and a lot of it had to do with evolution. A lot of it had to do with being very cautious about teaching scientific truths to students who were ostensibly just off the farm. And again, in 1915, you're talking less than 5% of the American uh, population going to college. So a very, very different environment. Since 1940, uh, the 1940 statement has been basically the gold standard. You covered two aspects of it in your intro. Freedom to research and freedom to present the results and freedom in the classroom. Within bounds, right, the classroom present presentations have to be relevant to the subject matter. You can't have um, metallurgy professors going off about Ukraine or what have you. Where things get tricky and where AAUP and FIRE often find themselves on the same side and sometimes at odds is with extramural speech. And that is, the contours of that has, has really changed over the past 80 years. Uh, it was initially felt that Professors who speak in public should do so with a certain amount of dignity and equanimity and so forth. And uh, we discuss in the, case, uh, in the book the infamous case of Leo Koch at the University of Illinois, who was fired from his job in the early 60s for writing an editorial suggesting that students should engage in premarital sex. As we know, if he just waited a couple of years, no one would have been batted an eye. So now it's kind of, uh, that's where most of the controversies happen. They happen on Twitter, they happen in social media, they happen in extramural speech. And there, academic freedom overlaps with, but it's not the same as the First Amendment, and things get very, very tricky indeed. And really, with each passing year, um, this is the function of the AUP's Committee A on Academic Freedom and Tenure, is to try to adjudicate the changing contours of what constitutes acceptable, uh, the acceptable boundaries of academic freedom in the public sphere. Professor Ruth, now what do you find wrong about that historical interpretation, which is, which is the raison d'etre of the book, of course. What do I find wrong about what my co-author just... No, just, wrong, just, not, not about what he just said, but I guess in a certain sense, yes. Like, what do you find wrong about this historical interpretation of academic freedom? 
Um, I'm not quite sure I understand the way that you framed the question, but can I just add a, a angle that I think Michael sure. left out? Sure. That I think is necessary, which may be a way of saying what's wrong with that version of events, which is that, um, you know, there's been a very well funded, well organized campaign of right wing money to create the impression that the university is the same as the general uh, public marketplace of journalism and communication and free speech. And so what I mean by that is that first you have this uh, the creation of a kind of both sidesism that happens even as early as probably before this, but with the tobacco industry and the sense, the pressure on journalists to present both sides of a tobacco issue, say. And then this leads to the sense of a certain kind of conventional notion of impartiality that requires you to discuss both sides. And that's become a very dominant narrative that has shaped the uh, discussions around the First Amendment for sure but has also ended up distorting and warping conceptions of academic freedom. And so whereas we're not, we're not trying to engage in, while there are a number of people, right, Emily Bazelon, there's a couple of books coming out, uh, you know, on the paradox of democracy and free speech and perilous persuasion is one. Uh, Lee Bollinger and Jeffrey Stone have one on social media, freedom of speech and the future of democracy. So there are lots of conversations around First Amendment, uh, social media, and the effect on our democracy, we're not engaging in those. We're engaging in the question of academic freedom and how, it, you know, whatever we may personally think about whether our First Amendment goes too far, whether we should look to Germany and, you know, all of the kind of different ways in which people think about the First Amendment, we're saying academic freedom is not one and the same as free speech. And it doesn't require, in the sort of both sides of the logic that has shaped and to some extent disfigured are the public marketplace of ideas doesn't apply to the university. In the university with academic freedom, this is vetted speech. This is speech that has to speak to one's fitness and expertise. This is this is not uh, all opinions are equal. This is not a world in which all opinions are equal. And I would just add to that, that this is also a place that is adjudication is handled differently. So we can argue about whether the Atlantic magazine is properly presenting both sides of a story or whether their roster of journalists represents a good cross section of viewpoints. Um, we can debate all those things and the uh, and, uh, and people can sue for libel and all kinds of things and use the court system uh, in the public in the with journalism and newspapers in the public sphere. Um, but in academia, one of the things that the 1915 and the 1940 statements in the AUP has been keen to argue is that there is a tension and it's a tension that has to be pretty sophisticatedly navigated between the collective rights of faculty to police one another and the individual rights of an individual faculty member for free expression and, and academic freedom. So to some extent, the way in which these kinds of issues should be adjudicated should be different in the university and autonomous from legislators, donors, alumni, um, courts. Uh, and we need to be uh, controlling what's, what's high value speech that needs to be built upon and uh, furthered and what's low value speech that isn't based on any expertise, facts, evidence, et cetera. And we need to be able to say that instead of sort of being beholden to a both sides logic. Professor Barabay? Um, in our, we recently published an excerpt from the New Republic, and one of the things we went after was a statement by the AUP itself, which we think confuses the issue really horribly. And that statement says in part, an institute, excuse me, an institution of higher learning fails to fulfill its mission if it asserts the power to proscribe ideas. Indeed, by proscribing any ideas, any ideas, a university sets an example that profoundly deserves its academic mission. Now, at the time, that's 1994, that was a response to the controversies over speech codes, which is pretty much the first way that critical race theory, on my shelf right behind me, uh, <clears throat> for handy reference, made its way into the academy. And one of the things we argue is that there's a whole body of work in critical race theory that never really got uh, dealt with. They got all sort of shunted into the question of sheep, uh, 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 speech codes, and, you know, in some ways, that was the work of, you know, volumes like Words That Wound. But um, the important thing there is that 
it, it just makes no sense. The it, a university violates its mission by prescribing any any ideas. Uh, we don't have a department of phrenology, nor should we have one. And um, this is kind of a free speech absolutism that made its way into the AUP into that statement that arguably doesn't even work for the First Amendment, doesn't even have an exception for shouting fire in a crowded theater or for defamation and libel, as, as Jennifer was just alluding to. And we think uh, the AUP itself <clears throat> has sometimes gone wrong uh, in this way. That's, that <clears throat> statement also it, it applies very differently to student speech than to professorial speech. As Jennifer's arguing, professorial speech should be regulated. There should be constraints on what professors can plausibly do and say. Otherwise, we would have departments of phrenology and departments of human sacrifice. So do you, do you see academic freedom as an individual right, or do you see it – collective right isn't the right word, right? Because you're not talking about more of like a, a departmental right or the right of a discipline, for example. Yeah, no, that's, the, that's exactly the tension that Jennifer was alluding to, and it's never been resolved, um, especially in the courts. The courts, is, it's just a mismatch of decisions on this, and that's why we turn to Robert Post's book. Do you want to take it from here, Jennifer? Because you're the one who suggested we, we do that. Yeah, so Robert Post has a really good book from, I think, 2012, Democracy, Academic Freedom, and Expertise, a First Amendment Jurisprudence, a modern, I can't remember the exact yeah, title. But I'll it, put it in, it in the it show is, notes. <laughs> Thank you. In short, he argues that we need the First Amendment for what he would call, the, what anyone might call democratic legitimacy. We need to live in a society where we feel like uh, we can criticize our government, we can say things about uh, our supreme leaders, et cetera, and not get thrown in jail. Um, and we need to be able to express and debate views to feel like we're in a democracy, not a totalitarian or authoritarian country. Um, but he says we also need democratic competence. So for citizens to be able to engage in an informed way. I'm not a climate scientist. I'm not a biologist or an environmental person. Like I need to be able to read, I need to be able to understand that certain people who have been vetted through these institutions that we've created um, that buttress and support democracy, like higher education, that these people do know more about the subject and I can trust their peer reviewed work. And then I can, you know, funnel that into my various arguments. And we need to be able to trust in some democratic competence. And in order to do, and, institu and universities are the place where democratic competence is provided for a democracy by way of vetting ideas, uh, making sure that ideas are based on evidence, good reasoning, that they're peer reviewed, that they're not, they cannot be simply reduced to mere opinion. And mere opinion and the work uh, you know, of years in peer review are not equivalent to one another. And to the extent that uh, a kind of devolving of a notion of academic freedom into free speech, it sort of takes away all of that sense of the competence. Um, and at the same time, if we weren't holding academic free speech, the professor, professorial speech to a higher standard than mere opinion, we wouldn't be able to provide democratic competence for, for democracy. So this, one way of answering this is to uh, go to the very end of your question, Nico, when you suggested that maybe we're relying on the idea of disciplinary expertise, right? Uh, the problem with that, of course, and we acknowledge it freely, and we'll do it right now, is that that's somewhat building uh, things on sand because disciplines themselves shift. It has been pointed out to us more than once that once upon a time, the disciplinary consensus was that the earth is stable and the sun revolves around us. And in fact, you could be executed for saying otherwise. And in fact, I mean, my answer to that is the history of science is fascinating with regard to how those paradigm shifts change. And I think T.S. Kuhn wrote an entire book about this. So how, in fact, we understand that we don't need to study phlogiston anymore, right? Or that, in fact... <clears throat> Um, the uh, dark energy and dark matter are real things that you know require uh, exp ex exploration. Those are fascinating developments of, of the contours of a discipline, and then you've got new disciplines. You've got disciplines stemming from the social movements of the 60s. You've got disciplines like anthropology and sociology that were created in the late 19th century. And then you've got people like me who don't, I don't actually have a degree in dis disability studies because when I got my PhD, it didn't exist. And people helped create that field in the humanities over the course of the last 30, 35 years. So it's tricky to uh, defer to disciplinary expertise, but I, as with so much else we argue in the book, we think it's the worst alternative except for all the others. Yeah, because you talk in the book about the Dunning School, for example, as being both wrong and having dominated the tradition in academia for a long time. It, it seems, and 
I'm maybe jumping ahead too far here. You propose sort of academic committees with disciplinary expertise to police the limits and bounds of academic freedom. But it seems like these committees would potentially uh, capture the dominant ideology, right? Like it seems more likely a tool to entrench a field's orthodox viewpoint because minority viewpoints, you know, we, and we can talk about critical race theory here, or more likely to face scrutiny at their outset, but might be true or the, be the best sense of truth in the long term. So how do you avoid that sort of capture by an entrenched disciplines sitting on these committees? Can I speak to that one? Because I, it actually dovetails nicely on something that I was thinking at the end of the last question when Michael was talking about how disciplines change and evolve and the tensions at the edges of a discipline that help produce new knowledge. And I was thinking, and, and he mentioned the new departments that uh, are from social movements in the 1960s. And I was thinking about, because I think a lot about when I'm working on these kinds of issues, the role of women's studies departments, black studies department. I was a women's studies concentrator at Swarthmore as an undergrad. And the, these, these departments that are seen to be as a uh, sort of by definition political in some way are hot spots right now for these kinds of conversations, of course. So a women's studies, women, gender and sexuality studies kind of department, it evolved out of the other disciplines, right? English literature professors were writing about reading Shakespeare from a feminist perspective, thinking about gender and, you know, a Midsummer's Night Dream, that kind of thing. It, they evolved out of the disciplines and they were extremely contested, difficult battles. And one of the new kinds of knowledge that I think that has emerged over the last 30, 50 years since these departments have been, you know, uh, established is the fact that the our, our world is not an equal playing field with impartial, neutral perspectives. The very point that you're making, Nico, and that some of the marginal viewpoints might help push things forward. And I will bring it back around to the academic freedom committees and how this relates to that. Um, but the idea that perspectives that haven't been heard might change the way we understand some, the way it's been understood before. And so that that concept that we're all socially situated and there there isn't an omniscient sort of objective, not non-embodied perspective, that comes out of women's studies departments and black studies departments. And it's critical to the conversations we're having right now in terms of, for example, when uh, on the cover of, or the front page of the Inside, Hi Inside Higher Ed, if it were paper, there's an article about the Shawnee State person who sued, the faculty member who sued because he refused on the grounds of his religion to call his student by the student's preferred pronoun. Um, when we think about the idea that, uh, that, 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 that there's, not, there's not a neutral and partial perspective from which to deal with these things. And so the, the ground is changing under our feet in terms of who's situated in different ways and how we, how we, how as a group, as academics, and this brings us back to the academic committee, how we want to navigate these changes and tensions because, um, and so the Academic Freedom Committee, okay, so you raise a really good point, and it's a point that a number of people have raised with us, which is these are predominantly white institutions still. They're precisely the institutions that, you know, pro create, were the academic apprentice to Jim Crow for decades. Why in the world do you think that the Academic Freedom Committees, that the faculty ourselves are going to be better adjudicators of these issues than the courts or uh, a more diverse population at large? Um, and I would argue that it, it is actually precisely because of the establishment of black studies and women's studies departments and the changes over time. And the fact that it's by no, it, if you're at Hillsdale College and you have an academic freedom committee, yeah, I'm not sure what, where that academic freedom committee might come down on various things. It's a risk, but it's a risk that we don't have any choice. We would rather, if if we hand authority over ourselves outside of the university, we've given up our academic freedom. Or so internal to the university, to right? Right. Often these, as you talk about in your book, are adjudicated by administrators. We spent about an hour yesterday in one of our meetings because I brought up your book and we spent an hour pretty much every morning reviewing the cases that come into us each day. And at the end, we have conversations about them. And I brought up your guys' book and we started talking about this. And the consensus within FIRE was that, yeah, these, that's a good idea. Right, because we have cases like Teresa Buchanan at Louisiana State University, where the faculty 
committee within the Senate, which had no actual power but to make a recommendation to the provost and president, ignores the recommendation and fires her anyway. I and mean, we see this all the time. You know, we Linfield can, College right now. Exactly. Right. Daniel Paul Pelsner, yeah. Yeah. The fact I, you the know, Senate voted no confidence. Yeah. And I, I so I think we we agree with you guys on the structure of how these should be adjudicated. But I, I think, think your question is right. What's because, that? And to go back to your question, there, there, I wanted to distinguish what we're proposing, academic freedom committees, from academic committees in general. Because you're entirely right that uh, committees of other faculty can, in fact, enforce a, a majoritarian view and have done so for decades. Joan Locke Scott's career is really eloquent testimony to this. She had to write an essay called Gender, an Important Category of Historical Analysis to Put Gender on the Agenda. And I saw this at the University of Illinois firsthand in 1994, not 1894, where there were some people in the history department said they weren't really sure that a book about the history of abortion was really history. And, you know, that person uh, won a couple of awards, and the book is called When Abortion Was a Crime, uh, coming soon to a state near you. And um, <laughs> her name is Leslie Regan. And she had to make the case, right, that this is a legit kind of history. It's not military. And now, of course, that, that argument has long since been won. And people say, well, where's traditional history? Where's military history? But it took a long time to put that on the table. So I think it's entirely true that disciplines can enforce. And that's one. The, the, we borrow the argument about disciplinarity from Scott. She said, you have to understand that disciplinary, sometimes you know, treason to a discipline is the, is the is greatest fidelity to it. So our committees that we're suggesting wouldn't go into the weeds that deep. We're looking more at, you know, what kind of things like the difficult case of Mark Crispin Miller at NYU, who is basically an adherent of every conspiracy theory in the last 20 years, or James Tracy, who is a, a Sandy Hook truther and who did lose his job, or and we're trying to move white supremacy, this, the advocacy of white supremacy, over to the category of phrenology and like, let's not go there anymore. It doesn't have any intellectual validity. We make no argument about whether it's offensive or not. That's not where we're at. We think it's just illegit intellectually illegitimate. So our academic freedom committees would be operating at a pretty high level of abstraction and only for the marginal cases where we decide, well, this actually doesn't, this doesn't make the, the cut the, uh, clear the bar for democratic competence at all. This, this should not actually be a legitimate academic thing. But I think that's entirely right. One final word about peer review, though. I want to borrow, I want to go back to 1970, I think it is, uh, Jameson Reisman's book, The Academic Revolution. Uh, they argued that what, uh, and in fact, and Jonathan Culler in our field picked this up again 20 years later. He said, you look at what happened in literary studies over the last 20 years, the explosion of theory, the explosion of fields. It happened because we had peer review. Because as Jensen Reisman pointed out, we stopped doing review by administrative top-down measures and turned things over to external reviews from other faculty at other universities. And oh my God, a thousand flowers bloomed. And a lot of people were not happy with that, but you know, eventually um, they lost. So it's really, it's, it's a, that's why it's a complicated question. Disciplines can be, uh, we've used the word policing now twice. They can really discipline and punish members, uh, but they're also incredibly pliable. And if you turn things over to peer review, like I say, uh, I'm glad to hear we're at least something went on the same page that way. It is much better than turning it over to mid or top level administrators who sometimes make the wrong intellectual decisions and sometimes make expedient political decisions. And the next thing you know, you're suspended because you said a Chinese word that sounded like the N-bomb. And that's just nuts. Administrators are much more vulnerable to external influence. Yeah. And, I mean, it's, uh, it's almost the best of the alternatives, right? Like, administrators can be subject to all the, you know, there can be internal politics, so score settling, the same way that you could find that within a faculty department. One thing that, you know, because FIRE is a public interest law firm uh, that our attorneys brought up is, you know, faculty who sit on these committees, if they have ultimate disciplinary authority, are going to be d listed as defendants if one of the people who are punished sues, right? So how do you address that? You know, does the university indemnify them so that they don't face uh, personal and financial liability? You know, I'm, I don't know uh, whether all of us are always, I think I'm the oldest person in this thing, but I remember the Palmolive commercial. Nico, you're already soaking in it. Uh, we have a committee here on Penn, Penn State, the Standing Joint Committee on Tenure. I served on it. And basically, it's basically the Standing Joint Committee on Revoking Tenure is what that really means. And we've got a case ongoing that I can't say anything about, and which I, I think is a travesty, so it shows you that even the best procedures can be abused. But I was on a case some years ago, can't say anything about that one either, and the reason is, if the, the person involved decided to sue, they could subpoena anyone I've ever talked to. 
right? So I already knew that I was in that kind of jeopardy. And it, it, so we already have systems for not every university has the same thing, but we already have um, uh, means of revoking tenure, usually for non performance or for grave misconduct. Uh, what we're proposing is something that extends that to people promoting batshit conspiracy theories under the heading of <coughs> communications theory <coughs> or media analysis. Uh, but the, the, the danger would be the same. The jeopardy would, for the faculty member on the committee would be exactly the same as it is now. So, and I think this is where we're going to have some disagreement, right? So I, I think there's the structure. Faculty governance, shared governance is way better than <clears throat> an administrator deciding uh, you know, whether something fits within the concept of academic freedom for that discipline. And they have no idea anything about that discipline. Uh, you guys write in the book, to be sure, professors should not be fired simply for obnoxious beliefs. But if those beliefs demonstrate unfitness, professional incompetence, then they are grounds not merely for criticism, but dismissal. And one of the made motivating concerns, and you have already spoken to this, is white supremacy, racism, uh, one of the professors who you discuss at length in the book, it's kind of a through line, is Amy Wax and her comments about Asian immigration. You know, well, those are the most recent comments. The one we went really after is the, uh, the speech to the National Conservatism Conference a couple of years ago, uh, arguing for a cultural distance nationalism. You know, so, to, so, so where do you draw the line between what is, is, you know, is that obnoxious or is that disqualifying racist speech? Because... You know, you talk about Asian immigrants and you talk about, you know, caps on immigration. I think her argument was that Asian immigrants would vote Democratic, so we should, you know, shouldn't have any more immigration in the, in the country. Within the immigration debate, lots of things get labeled racist. Lots of things get labeled white supremacist. We see that all the time. Support for the police is white supremacy. Support for free speech is white supremacy. Guy Benson, there was a petition at Brown to have him disinvited from speaking there because capitalism is white supremacy. So, you know, you have, you have these concept creeps and maybe you don't think that's concept creeps. Maybe you guys think those aren't within the scope of legitimate debate, but drawing those lines. And I know professor Ruth talked about how this is a very sophisticated, probably facts and fact intensive analysis, but we worry that there is going to be potentially overreach and we're going to start labeling lots of things that are racist, white supremacy, disqualifying speech that, Maybe even half the country agree with, right? right. Well, if can, I, can, I, can I just say one thing? Go ahead, go ahead, Jennifer. Because it speaks to uh, what I was saying in the very beginning of, of the podcast, which is the incredible campaign to weaponize free speech. And what's been really interesting, so I understand the worry, the worry that uh, legitimate discourse is going to be the creep that you're talking about. It's going to be ruled out of bounds as racist or whatever. Um, I understand that worry. I think it's overblown. And I think it was purposefully overblown. And I think it's been very enlightening to me to move from, say, six, seven years ago, some of the articles around cancel culture, and then some of the new research that's done on those same incidents and seeing how much more, how certain things were taken out of context or exaggerated. So for example, Mike, you mentioned someone who, there was a petition to not let this person speak at Brown. The petition is, is free speech. Whether the petition prevails or not is a different question. And if it prevails, and, it, and things like that prevail repeatedly in ways that a majority of faculty feel like, or, or enough faculty argue is actually inhibiting good discourse, then we have a problem, but I'm not sure we're there. Mike Pence was, you know, there's all there were articles about he's not going to be allowed to speak. Oh my God, everything's out of control. He's allowed to speak, and it went without any problems. So this, I, I, I think that there has been a really purposeful over, uh, exaggeration of incidents on campuses that are taken out of context. And and I mean, if if, if we only talk about it at this moment, it absolutely needs to be said that there is no bigger threat to academic freedom than these bills and laws that are trying to censor teaching around race, gender justice, and critical race theory. That is a direct hit to academic freedom, not free speech. These are experts who have studied the history of slavery, studied Jim Crow, studied redlining, um, and they're raising questions and they're teaching our students about our history. And the idea that they're 
they should be censored because they're making people uncomfortable. That is an incredibly shocking partisan attack on on the democratic pursuit of knowledge and our ability to understand our own history. And that is so much bigger than an Oberlin student complaining about the Bon Mi. And then when you go and you actually research what the student, what all the other students said, you find out that it was taken out of context. There's been a pretty serious campaign to weaponize free speech. And that's what we need to remove academic freedom from because it's now creeping into our ability to teach our subjects. Well, so um, I want to go back to Amy Lax because um, I just had a debate with Keith Whittington here at Penn State about that. He was kind enough to drive out. Uh, first in-person thing I've done since I had a uh, did an event with you, Nico. Yeah. And, you know, we give uh, Keith Whittington a hard time for his defense of Amy Wax um, because he wrote on the Academe blog, I guess it was now almost four years, yeah, sometime four years ago, the Amy Wax case is not a hard case. And I said, you know, look, I think that's that's exactly wrong. It is a hard case. I don't think it's, there's an easy case for firing her. I don't think there's that, that's a, it's a slam dunk at all, partly because what she's doing is extramural speech. She has full First Amendment protection to say anything she wants, including the phrase shithole countries, which she used with, with that she quoted that from Trump without irony. <clears throat> and she, if she wants to cite Enoch Powell and Daniel Pipes and every you know, rabid, spittle flecked racist of the last 30 years, she has every constitutional right to do that. And you, it's really a very high bar to clear to say that that speech is so obnoxious and so intellectually vacuous that it demonstrates unfitness. I am not prepared to say that. She is under investigation now at Penn. At Penn. It's up to them. Uh, Jennifer and I <laughs> promised each other in the course of this book that we would not actually try to adjudicate every case from coast to coast. The temptation was was tremendous, right? We, we deal with individual cases where we actually do have to make judgment calls. Sometimes we come down with fire and sometimes we do not. But <clears throat> that's, uh, I think Amy Wax is a tough one because it's extramural speech. I think the case against Mark Crispin Miller is a lot clearer, frankly. I mean, this affects his teaching and his research, and it is, uh, well, <clears throat> um, we, there's a line that we were asked to take out from the New Republic. I'm going to put right back in because it's in the book. Uh, people thought it was going to be too obscure. But, I mean, it's the equivalent of telling your students that you know, no one will tell you about the secret Apollo 18 mission in which two astronauts were killed on the lunar surface by hostile life forms. We think he's in that land now. Not just like the moon is green cheese, but it actually killed two astronauts. That's the kind of that's the quality conspiracy theory he's spouting at a time when QAnon has something like thirty million followers. And to go back to the argument about democratic competence, uh, we see over the last ten years since Post Book came out that um, now we have a nation of people who think they they know how to deal with the pandemic because they spent a half an hour on the internet with Joe Rogan. Okay, so we we see where that leads. <clears throat> so I think the, the wax case is difficult. I think also there's the possibility of um, white supremacy accusation creep, as you might put it. But I also want to say that we have a policy, along, <clears throat> we also agree, Jennifer and I, that we were not going to make any or take any slippery slope arguments until we could actually see a slippery slope that people were sliding down within 50 yards. <clears throat> because I, I think <clears throat> even in the context where um, terms uh, well, you know, like racist and socialist are you know almost detached from their meanings, I have to hope, we both, Jennifer and I, have to hope that academic freedom committees would take these things a little more seriously. On the topic of extramural speech, I don't know that, and I'm not recalling in the book, that you take a solid position on how that should be governed, uh, for example. But I do, you know, I do have concerns, right? Um, for example, a politics professor commenting on, on politics. Uh, what if they say something that's racist, white supremacist, but they're saying it in the context of a political conversation. You're, the line between extramural speech and you know speech within the discipline gets blurred, and then you, you're say, essentially saying that anyone who's a political science professor can't have a opinion on politics as a private citizen, lest that potentially fall within, you know, sweep within its ambit academic freedom concerns. I, I, I don't think these committees would go there, but, you know, drawing that bright line distinction, especially in some disciplines where public citizens comment on things a lot like political science, risks. Well, that, that's, again, uh, we're already soaking in it. Uh, our position, uh, we map out in chapter two, and I hope people who don't um, breathe this atmosphere every day will uh, 
forgive us for walking people through the history of AUP policy on extramarital speech in chapter two, because it is, again, the most contentious area of academic freedom. And uh, there have been attempts, uh, Judith Butler, uh, for example, a couple of years ago, just said it shouldn't, academic, um, extramural speech shouldn't be covered by academic freedom at all. It should just be covered by the state, which is a European tradition. Uh, we think there's all kinds of dangers with that, and we spell those out in the chapter. But the paradox we have now is precisely the one your question just spoke to. We have, Jennifer and I, more protection for speaking in public about things we know nothing about which is why I'm about to tell you that the Super Bowl was in fact fixed. Right? <laughs> but, or nothing else will explain those calls at the end of the game. <laughs> if I start speaking in my area of expertise about disability and start saying, you know, actually, Buck v. Bell was rightly decided, uh, three generations of imbeciles are enough, and the people with intellectual disabilities are a drain on the rest of us. Um, <laughs> actually, people like Richard Dawkins actually do say these things. Um, but if I said it, I would start to think um, this Barabay guy may be unfit um, <clears throat> for doing anything in disability studies. So, yeah, there's an inverse relationship here. That's what makes – it's like a Mobius strip of, of, of uh, academic freedom and free speech. You enjoy more protection uh, under the Pickering test, right, <clears throat> the common, uh, common Pickering test. You enjoy more protection when you speak – uh, as a non-expert than, in, than you speak as an expert. Now, your question about political science, yeah, that's why people who deal with political science, sociology, <clears throat> any um, public-facing field, uh, to think very carefully what part of this is directly related to my expertise. I work on voting rights, and what part of it has to do with epidemiology that's not part of my expertise at all, right? Um, but yeah, no, that's why, exactly why it's tricky. Um, my f- and, yeah. Sure, go ahead. Oh, I would just add that... Um you know, the, the larger context for this is a discussion around which speech and the health of our democracy is it, are, the, are the stakes. And it seems to me that while it's no one can keep anything from getting abused and everything in, you know, it, academic freedom committees could potentially be populated by faculty who do have their own beefs and histories with the person that they're going after in the same way that an administrator might have uh, compromised reasons to make decisions. Um, All of those things can't be controlled. But the reality is that we are in a situation in which there's a really good book. I haven't I haven't gotten my hands on all of it. I've only read parts of it by Richard Hausen called Cheap Speech and How It's Poisoning Our Democracy. Um, And so, again, he's dealing with speech in general, not with speech, academic speech. But this sense that there are people like John Eastman who are claiming that he and using his background as an academic to make claims around constitutional law that 99.999% of other lawyers, academic lawyers disagree that his creative, so-called creative academic interpretation of the law is simply wrong. So we are looking, we're looking at the point, ideally these academic freedom committees would be trying to do its part to preserve some legitimacy of democratic competence in our society by could by taking care of our own house in a sense so there's that one there's that wonderful slash horrible exchange between that the new york times um uh, exposed recently between eastman and P, uh, pence's lawyer and pence's lawyer is like john i respect you academics and your crazy ideas and most of the time i think that's a good a good thing for there to be fringe ideas that are being explored but when it's that fringe, when it's Scott Atlas and 99.9% of his peers, in, or he's not an epidemiologist, but when epidemiologists are saying, don't use Stanford to say that masks aren't helpful, or whatever it was at that time in which um, when Trump was president, when 99.9% of the experts in your field are saying, that's not based on good reasoning. That's or that's been that's already been debunked and delegitimized. Um, so please don't use your, your academic platform as a way to pursue something that seems like disinformation or misinformation, either one, yeah. it doesn't matter. Well, what I'm I'm trying to sort through in my mind is how do you how do you institute these committees without, and this is maybe circling back to my previous question, without dismissing the oddball who might in the end be right, like right, like we thought Newton's theory. Uh, f- theory of physics was entirely right until Einstein introduced relativity, right? And it was uh, initially dismissed. And to bring it to a controversial current political topic and to get back to the concept creep around racism, right? Like 
the idea of the lab leak theory. You know, it's not a rock solid theory anymore, but Tom Smith at the University of San Diego was brought under investigation for arguing it. Facebook was taking off posts in favor of it. But then you, you know, right now it's the position of the intelligence agencies that it's, you know, just as if not close to as viable a position as the, um, the, the food market theory. So it's like, you know, there are, and taking that position for a time was called racist. It's not, I don't think anymore. Um, but th that's the sort of thing. It's like, if we would have closed the door in May, 2020 to that opinion, there's some stuff that we wouldn't have learned. You know, the investigations by New York magazine and New York times into the theory. The, um, and, and, and I just worry, I worry too much about that. Yeah. And that's why I was concerned about the Princeton committee investigating racism, uh, rather than, General, you know, general academic freedom concerns. Well, I think you're, you're talking about, um, let, let's go to the history of science. Um, I have an amateur interest in this. Um, and I still have some friends who are physicists. So when I was an undergraduate, I was taught that uh, this would not be asked to, this not going to be on the final. But Paul Dirac, toward the end of his life, had something called the large numbers hypothesis, which suggested that the number of atoms in the universe and the ratio between strong and weak forces um, has something to do with each other. The rate, it was, <clears throat> the large numbers were 10 to the 40th, 10 to the 40th, and 10 to the 80th. They seem to have some relation to each other. So that would suggest that among, uh, the, among the implications of this very strange theory would be that the uh, force of gravity changes over time. It, <clears throat> uh, it weakens over time, and that throws off any attempt to measure the age of the universe. Well, that was 40 years ago. And astrophysics has gotten to the point where no one takes that seriously any longer. Uh, it's just a guy toward the end of his career coming up with some really crazy suggestions. But everyone entertained it because back in the 20s and 30s, Dirac had proposed antimatter. And he was laughed out of the room because it sounds like science fiction. And all he was doing was running Einstein's equations for general relativity and saying, you know, these can be solved either way. You can have uh, positively charged electrons and negatively charged quartons. And we do. And the question is why it's not symmetrical. And no one's answered that one yet. So Dirac picks up a Nobel Prize for that. And guess what? You know, he gets to be on these committees now because he's a distinguished scientist and not, in fact, a crank. My own personal take on this, if I were on an academic freedom committee, is to take that sort of attitude. Um, we'll entertain antimatter. We'll entertain the large numbers hypothesis. We'll entertain the lab leak theory. We're not going to rule any of that stuff out. It's TBD. And then we're talking about the last, you know, non-experimental science here, astrophysics, and even there, you know, the the, uh, the fact that Einstein put a cosmological constant into gravity's in, into the general relativity equations, then it looked like that was a terrible mistake because it suggested the universe was not expanding, and now most recently it's come back as a possible explanation for why uh, the universe is not going to collapse back in on itself. So the whole question of the cosmological constant is back in after being ruled out for about ninety years. I think we need to be ecumenical about that. But at the same time, I don't think this really shouldn't be anything controversial in taking not just racism. Racism is what racism not, is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about theories that white people are biologically or culturally superior to other people. I think the door is closed on that one. I don't think we're going to find evidence, you know, decades from now saying, whoa, white supremacy. Yeah. Right. Who knew? It's just like it's just like that Paul Dirac guy. You know, I, I think Can I to that yeah, go ahead. Uh, the, the, a lot of what we're doing i think you know it is vulnerable to getting misinterpreted because um when when what when what's not taken into consideration is that we're very much speaking to higher education the academic context um you know uh, the pursuit of truth for the common good is, for the common good is a phrase that the aup often uses and given that context it's not a social media mob. It's not a student protest. An academic committee will be a lot slower and more deliberative than would an administrator who's got somebody breathing down his neck, than would uh, you know a professor who's got a bunch of students clamoring at her, at her door. An academic freedom committee, and we'll also have a dispersed responsibility. So there's there's a there's a different judicial or sort of procedural context for these that that prevents some of the kind of arbitrariness. It, it won't prevent all of it, but prevents some of the arbitrariness and some of the uh, 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 preemptive thinking that would knock out ideas that we actually need. Um, so there's that. And then there's also the fact that um, the 
faculty, what we have to bear in mind is how many faculty, one of the things that makes it hard for me to keep saying that I believe that the idea that uh, we have these snowflakes or these outraged social justice mobs and that I feel like this has been taken up and exaggerated and used for political purposes is that my uh, all of us have a certain amount of what I would call tenured fragility in the sense that we will put up with almost any idea for fear that uh, of us alleged slippery, this is the psychology of the faculty member, fear of the alleged slippery slope that something I say, for example, I'm extraordinarily critical. I teach uh, Chinese cinema, East Asian and Sinophone cinema, and I'm extraordinarily critical of the CCP. And I think a lot about Chinese nationalists, international students in my class. And so the my, the knee-jerk instinct of almost every faculty member is to want to protect at all costs their colleagues' uh, rights to, to explore as freely as they want and to, and to make mistakes. So there's that. There's the fact that an academic freedom committee made up of faculty are going to be very loath to dismiss someone um, uh, without being very thoughtful about it. And then the, finally, the other thing I would say, the reason why race and the, the issue that Michael just brought up, the idea that there's any culturally inferior or a group that's less able to navigate society than another group for biological cultural reasons. The reason why that has to, why we're singling that and out and that has to get removed is also the academic context. And it also has to do with the sense of democratic legitimacy in the post sense. In the classroom, we have to walk into the classroom as faculty members, presuming that everyone has a polit potentially valid point of view that can that they can bring to discussion, right? We have to assume that any kind of ideology or argument that some people are inherently less rational, inherently less capable as a woman, you know, coming up in the 80s, I certainly was had the white noise of women being less rational in my head in every philosophy classroom I, I sat in. So any kind of argument that some people are less capable than others in certain kinds of arenas, that has to be that has to be left outside because that fundamentally distorts what can happen in the classroom. So the academic context is really critical to our argument and it does, and I think it changes the nature it, it, of, of how to think about academic freedom versus free speech. How, how do you think then about a David Reich, for example, who got a lot of backlash in the New York Times, he's a professor of genetics at Harvard who wrote the, uh, the op-ed, I think it was in 2018, how genetics is changing our understanding of, of race. He said, I have deep sympathy for the concern that genetic discoveries could be misused to justify racism. But as a geneticist, I also know that it is simply no longer possible to ignore average genetic differences among race. This is a sitting professor right now, Harvard University, wrote the book, Who We Are and How We Got Your Ancient DNA and the New Science of the Human Past. And he, but he takes your point. He says, with the help of these tools, we are learning that while race may be a social construct, differences in genetic ancestry that happen to correlate to today to many of today's racial constructs are real. And he's worried that well-meaning people, and I'm quoting him here, who deny the possibility of substantial biological differences among human populations are digging themselves in an indefensible position, one that will not survive the onslaught of science. So, you know, what do we do about a, a David Rice who's saying, no, you know, I, I know you guys, Professor Barabay and Professor Ruth are saying that this is something that we shouldn't touch, but he's arguing it's something we actually do need to touch because science will get there. And he thinks race is a social construct. Um, and he, he agrees with, with you almost entirely about the takeaways, but not that we shouldn't study it or we shouldn't discuss it. Um, and you guys might not be familiar with the op-ed, so I know I realize I'm putting you on the spot. It's not in your book. <laughs> um, well, I'm Googling it now and I'm not coming up with it. Um, this, let me just take a stab at it, though, from a general perspective with regard to intellectual disability. Because you may know that um, it, it doesn't take a lot of genetic research to, to find out that I have a, a son with Down syndrome. And there is no question that people with Down syndrome are biochemically in every cell different from people without Down syndrome. I also remember, uh, I, I'm, I had to uh, laugh, I'm teaching a disability studies course now, and I had to laugh when I told my students, apparently we now have the human genome. We were told we had it 20 years ago, we only had 92% of it. But I'm that old to remember uh, that I remember when uh, it came, we came close to completing the Human Genome Project, both with Francis Collins and with Crank Vedner. Um, a lot of people in disability studies were very antsy about that. They thought, this is going to usher in the world of Gattaca. This is going to bring us back to eugenics. There were all kinds of, in fact, I could 
point to Michael Sandel's The Case Against Perfection being written in 2004 as a caution against genetic engineering. This is forbidden knowledge. We shouldn't go there. It's going to be cloning. It's going to be, it's going to be a dystopia. And of course, uh, that hasn't come to pass. And I think that there are people, I've, I've actually said in the past, there's some people, especially in the humanities, when they hear, hear the word genome, they reach for their guns. And they think the finding the genetic basis of anything will inevitably be a loss of human freedom. I don't believe that. I know there's a biochemical basis, a genetic basis for Down syndrome. And the question is, how do we treat people with Down syndrome? So I come out on the same end of this as well. And I'm just not as allergic to um, genetic explorations of human difference as some other people are. The question is, A, what do we do with it? And B, like, for example, when you found sickle cell anemia, what have you found? Have you found blackness? When you find Tay-Sachs, what have you found? Have you found Ashkenazi Jews? No, you found you know, genetic traits associated with certain populations. Those are real, and we should continue to explore them. But we should still, also still, in the realm of actual interactions and policy, uh, keep believing that all humans are created equal. Let's say, let's say, for example, that it is out of bounds, right? Just take for argument's sake that, that it is out of bounds. You know, what do well, you what do? What would that look like, though? Well, that, that's, my, that's my question, right? Like, you know, what do you do with the people who make those arguments? For example, you know, what do you do with the James Watson, right? Who's got a Nobel Prize for the, as a co-discoverer of DNA, right? Like people can have crazy ideas, even within their field, you know, maybe 5% of their ideas are just so far afield right. that, you know, what do you do if they're brought to talk about the other 95%? Like you guys might dislike, you know, I can see it from the book, Charles Murray in every regard. But his book, Coming Apart, did kind of talk about the polarization we're seeing today. And that's largely what he was brought to campus to speak about in the past five years, not the bell curve, which has made him a controversial figure. So it's, it's this question of like, are we, are we in, an, in the academic environment, are we interested in the ideas or can a person be disqualifying because of something in their back? Like Henry Ford, for example, he in, you know, invented industrialized America um, for better or worse but he also was a raging anti-Semite and a raging, you know, so it's like, how, how do we take the complicated parts of people and still allow the people with the really good ideas to have a place in academic academia to discuss those while leaving aside potentially stuff that these committees or whatnot might find are outside of the discipline. Well, mm -hmm. to go to Henry Ford for a moment. I'm going to say, well, he wasn't an academic, but Joy Carriga was at Oberlin and she was a raging anti-Semite. She lost her job over that. And we think that's legit and not everyone, um, not everyone in the AUP, not everyone in academia agrees with us about that. You'll note also, it's a, a side discussion, but we make no argument against the hiring of Peter Singer or John Yu. Peter Singer at Princeton or John Yu at Berkeley, that was con very controversial in both ways, in both cases. But we said, look, um, Singer's work on animal rights, Singer's work on poverty is really valuable, very interesting. Uh, when it comes to intellectual disability, he is incredibly blinkered and sometimes just downright ignorant. You, I don't know as well because I don't know him except for the torture memos. Um, but we don't really, we don't argue for the firing of people for one obnoxious and illegitimate uh, belief. We believe in taking things in their totality. And um, that's why, again, we turn this over to committees of our peers, especially in areas where we have no expertise and we can't say, I can say some things about Singer. Um, and I would not be in favor of firing him. And when people in the disability community asked me to write an op-ed opposing his hiring at Princeton, I refused to do it. Um, because I don't think that well, the entire body of Singer's work is disqualified, by no means. So yeah, and, you, and you praise the animal rights work in the book, if I recall correctly. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm also old enough to remember when that book came out in 1975. And it, it, I mean, among people sympathetic to it, it was, it was hailed already as a, you know, masterpiece but a lot of people animal rights how crazy is this going to get and here we are 35 years later and every third person believes in it right so yeah and i would i would just add two things um uh one is that the the david reich who i'm not right that i'm not familiar with with this with studying the genes um on the one hand that that this conversation is happening is not a bad thing if biological difference, if, if the science goes in a certain direction that could be capitalized upon by certain interests. I mean, given what we've seen in, in, during the Trump years and then also in terms of the kind of um, attempt to use race as uh, a, a, in order to rally uh, voters, 
the the fact that we are thinking very carefully and very seriously about these issues is not a bad thing. The reason why I pressed you on the and so however David Reich articulates what he's learned, he's going to be very careful about it. And then pe how people then interpret it, they're going to need to be careful about it. And that's a good thing. And then the, the reason I pushed you on what does out of bounds mean is that we're in this environment right now where it's so polarized and it's either or either you're counseled or you're free. And the reality is that an academic freedom committee has a number of different things at its option at its hand at its, uh, it, it can do. So for example, it, we can decide that uh, a, a political scientist professor who has said outrageous things and made outrageous arguments about colonialism doesn't get to teach African politics. Um, but he's made he's written excellent books on China, say he can teach China. There are different kinds of maneuvers that academic freedom. It, it's not simply you're fired or you're not. You can be taken out of required courses. You can you well, let, another example. Um, and I'm forgetting the man's name um, and who was at University of Calif uh, North Carolina, uh, Wilmington. Um, oh, Mike. He, uh, was that Mike Adams? Yes, Mike Adams. We um, we, he, we do I, in our discussion yesterday. We do take some issue with how you frame that because you say that he he had qualifications that weren't academic qualifications, and the actual court record shows that he had more peer reviewed academic works than most people. Not everyone in his department, but most people in his department. He was also that's interesting. Okay, so that's really interesting. Um, and so that. I can't use him in his example as easily as I would have before, but that is exactly the point. If he were putting up, regardless of what the actual reality was, if he were putting up stuff that was not peer reviewed and trying to get that as a basis for promotion, the promotion and tenure committee was in their rights to say, no, that we're not going to promote you on the basis of this non peer reviewed work. Um, so that's the kind of thing that academic freedom committee would parse. Yeah. We had a lot of fun talking about the Mike Adams case and your guys' take on it yesterday. I should also say. the AAP. No, that was uh, speak, I mean, and also may he rest. Um, yeah. yeah. But the, the colonialism question is interesting and I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because there is a body count associated with colonialism that makes, that raises an ethical question. And you guys talk about, uh, you know, you, you know, professional incompetence and, you know, the questioning of ethics and that, you know, it, it, I think about colonialism, I'm like, okay, so as someone who's making the argument that Hong Kong should remain a British colony rather than get hand over by the Chinese, like, I don't think you're making that argument. Right. But there, there's a, there's a debate over that, you know, it's, or, or Neil, Ferg, Neil Ferguson and his empire, how Britain made the modern world makes right. arguments for colonialism. Um, you know, Anthony Bourdain goes to the Congo and parts are unknown, and you hear from the Congolese who, you know, it shocked me, say, we wish the Belgians would come back. It's like they're they're still like maintaining a scientific outpost that they abandoned decades before. Um, you know, and so when I think about body count and I think about how complicated these body counts can be, you know, I think about back to the Red Scare. It's like, okay, there's, there's, you know, at least 10 million people who were killed by the Soviet Union and gulags, famines, political, you know, up to 50 million, I think the best scholarship shows today. Would someone who have made an argument for, you know, in defense of the Soviet Union, you know, is that disqualifying? Uh, because I'm sure someone, you know, in Ukraine who suffered under the Holodomor, you know, famine would say, yeah, absolutely, that's disqualifying. Look what it did to... If the person minimized the truth of yeah. the of the body count and, or or apologized for it in ways that were incredibly um, or justifies it on his a historicized or tried to justify it in a cost benefit kind of analysis, and well, look, two generations later they had the railroad, so everything's okay. I mean, if 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 they if they were talking about it in a way that was patently objectionable on the grounds of history, yeah, they would be. But if they weren't, if they were saying you know. The communist Chinese Communist Party has lifted. I'm speaking today about contemporary yeah, mainland China. Has lifted lifted millions out of poverty. That's true. You can say that, and then you also can talk about the authoritarianism and the disappearing of people as well. We've never not been able to do that. It's in this polarized environment where some people are misrepresenting academics as as a uh, oh, you know, as, as saying one or the other thing. The whole it's, but they're wheel, well, they're also also wielding ethics, you know, right? So with, you know, at, at SUNY Fredonia with philosophy pro professor uh, Stephen Kirshner, he goes on a philosophy podcast and, you know, in philosophy, right, you question ethical assumption and arguments. And he starts questioning the ethics uh, around sexual contact between children and adults. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, he was playing devil's advocacy in a certain sense to understand why we truly think that's unethical, but he's not in the classroom right now. We had to give him a lawyer and he's still, you know, he's still under yeah. investigation. Uh, you know, so th this is why I get to the concerns around some of these vaguer terms like ethics and morals, because, and, and I think your academic freedom committees, to the extent that you've discussed them in this podcast would account for that because there are all these complicated boundaries that, you know, it, academics understand, but the administrator who put Professor Stephen Kirshner right. on leave did right. not understand. He did not understand that, for example, you know, and, and Jonathan Haidt, for example, likes to talk about how this, you know, philo philosophical question he poses to class. He says, let's say you have a brother and sister and they know that they cannot get pregnant, pregnant, no pregnancy. What's, what's, why is that ethically wrong for them to engage in sexual activity? Right, because the idea being that uh, you know sexual activity between partners, you know, results in complications for the fetus or whatever um, if they have a child. But um, you know, libs of TikTok, for example, they don't like any of that. They came after us real hard after we. Uh, well, I can imagine the Steve, Stephen Ferdonia case. Yeah, no, I mean, um, again, um, we're going to resort to the idea of the Academic Freedom Committee as being the worst alternative, except for all the others. <laughs> It's and like I democracy, think, right? Isn't that what Benjamin Franklin said? He said it's the best of all other options. Except that we want, uh, in the sense of democratic competence. Also, I think, you know, you're talking about, I mean, we were, we were thinking of uh, committees formed in people's areas of expertise, but if you didn't do that, if you had a university-wide committee, you'd wind up uh, with people on that committee ranging from uh, theorists of the avant-garde in art to uh, physicists, all of whom have some pretty wide tolerance for crazy ideas. Um mm -hmm. And also, the pretty wide tolerance also for thought experiments, like brothers and sisters uh, having sex, or why is it, look, I, I hope it was raised uh, um, in the case of, I'm, I'm forgetting his name, Fredonia. Uh, uh, Stephen Kirshner. Stephen Kirshner, even though I would never want to go there myself. Um, isn't it the case that, you know, for many, France doesn't even have the age of consent laws? That sort of explains sure. the, the very different attitude toward the, the, the point is that these lines are fungible. I still, I, I included in my book about Jamie, the 1996 one, uh, Life as We Know It, that uh, here's Peter Singer who believes that we should have a, a ceremony a month after birth and anything, any infanticide up to that point is, is legit. And I put him on a continuum with the Catholic Church's prescription against contraception. That there's a law, there's a wide array of beliefs here, you know, ranging from you know, every sperm is sacred to life begins at conception, to viability, to birth, to a period after birth. There's a lot of, you know, a, a really wide range of beliefs on when a fetus is actually a baby. Or for that matter, whether a blastocyte can even be considered uh, a human person. And I think uh, that's also why I wouldn't uh, oppose hiring Singer at Princeton. He's a fringe. Th thankfully, he's nowhere near state power. If he were, I might adjust the calculus a little differently. You know that we do mention that in the book. You know how um, likely is it that uh, an obnoxious belief might be operationalized? In the case of John Eastman, it almost was. Amy Wax and and Lawrence Mead are speaking to potential policymakers, and Paul Campos put it, a law professor from Colorado, University of Colorado. If Amy Wax were a Maoist, I would care less than I do about them right now. So I think one of the calculuses here has to be. Uh, how much? Uh, wait, wait, what's the potential for a body count here? Yeah. And again, I hope that uh, our proposal will at least be taken seriously, uh, not only for the committees but for uh, considering certain forms of belief in white superiority to be uh, vacuous and disqualifying. And Nico, I know we're running out of time, but there is a whole other. Do you guys have? I was going to ask if you had more time. I know. Uh, did you have classes? You got? Can I get ten more minutes? <laughs> Oh, thank you. No, yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, good. So I was just going to raise this question. Oh, I don't know. I can't speak for Michael. Michael, do you have 10 more minutes? Uh, this question, which is that one of the messiness of the, the situation that we're in today, the climate that we're in, the kind of cases that are uh, arising, is that it's not faculty, it's not only just administrators who are adjudicating, but it's also diversity, equity, and inclusion offices. And so some of these issues are very messy in terms of the border between, is it an academic fitness count question? Is it a kind of, uh, 
erasure of the historical record in terms of body count in a way that ends up distorting or making a, a, the argument kind of objectionable? Or is it racism and discrimination? And so, you know, my, my uh, example of the classroom, everybody, no matter what they look like, where they come from, how they identify, have to be presumed to be capable of offering a potentially uh, important contribution to the conversation, then that can't be. And if it, there's any kind of argument that sort of changes that that playing field in advance, it's ruled out of bounds. That's is that discrimination. And would that go to a DEI? And then you have the people who are the lawyers and the HR people who are hired by the administrators and work for the administrators who are adjudicating those kinds of things. So we were very specific in talking about fitness, and that's very clearly in the scholarly domain, right? That in shared governance, faculty have priority, you know, the administrators can control budgets, faculty have priority of curriculum and approving courses and expert and who's who can be hired and how, et cetera. Um, but we have these other offices now. And so one of the things that I think needs to happen is that faculty need to get more involved in some of the conversations. They're getting sort of parceled out and, and they're not always cleanly capable of being parceled out. And so something might be a professional code of conduct. If it doesn't clearly ring discrimination things, it might be a fitness question if you're up for promotion and review. Um, but these things are, are messy. And so one of the things that uh, we argue is that faculty need to start to take some uh, authority over these issues or at least get involved in these discussions more actively instead of outsourcing them to lawyers and HR people. So for example, I think I think it's perfectly legitimate for a university to the faculty senate. To, so for example, the N-word, can you use it when you're quoting, if you're a literature professor and you're uh, reading Baldwin can you, and you just are quoting a passage, can you use it or is that outrageous? And you, as, as a, or is, does it matter if you're black or white if you use it, et cetera? I think faculty senates can make rules around professional about uh, around those things for the university. At, within faculty democratically are making are having these discussions and making this decision, and then people have to follow them, as opposed to say a lawyer in a DEI office or an administrator or someone else deciding whether or not that person deserves sanction for having used the word. A quick note about the committees too that we didn't really cover, but I, that I find some value in is it would kind of. And correct me if I'm wrong, it might erase the academic freedom distinctions between tenured and non-tenured faculty or adjunct faculty, right? It, presumably, presumably yeah, they you. would be analyzed the same way. Now, there are some things that tenured faculty it's still get. still unfair right now. That right. Tenured fac- and you know, most of our, so we filed, you know, filed like what, 12 or 11 or 12 lawsuits in the past year and a half, two years, and most of them have been on behalf of non-tenured faculty. You talk about because some of the cases. Because they're vulnerable, right. Yeah, they don't- you talk about the Klinsman case, uh, which was one we rep- we provided him representation. Livingston was tenured. We provided him representation. But um. Um, yeah, fly on us for not raising that point. And thank you, Nico, for doing it. I want to yeah. get at this question another way by um, getting at the question of harm, which I think also is a place where there's really um, not much daylight between our position and fires. Um, you'll notice that we spend precisely zero words in the book talking about arguments being harmful because there you've got a, there actually is a really slippery slope we can see rebecca tuvel sliding down it uh, i was gonna i was gonna bring that up i was wait i was looking for it in the book i didn't see it but nope because i mean i'm already on record as written uh, writing in pmla that you don't uh try to retract a peer-reviewed essay by social media campaign because of putative harm um that way lies madness and chaos also, I mean, I take this from, um, I, I think, uh, in, in the acknowledgments, um, uh, of my own uh, the vice provost for diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, she's now at Colorado, Sonia DeLuca Fernandez, who assiduously avoided all discussion of harm, not only because she, it led to uh, what she called derisively trauma porn, but also because it allowed, I mean, my contribution to that was to say, yeah, that's where, when, it, when people su- suggested that Amy Wax's op-ed uh, in the Philadelphia Inquirer in 20. 17 or 18 caused harm, she came back with, yeah, the truth hurts. Suck it up. So the implication of harm is just a non-starter for us. Um, Arguing that Laura Kipnis's essay in the Chronicle caused harm to Northwestern students seems to us not worthy of serious consideration. So at no point are we talking about arguments that, again, putatively or even demonstrably cause harm. We're talking about arguments that have no legitimate intellectual basis whatsoever. Quite different standard. 
So that's another way of taking it out of the offices of DEI or Title IX or Human Resources and putting it back in the faculty. Where we I, actually, would just, I, would, I would soften that just a little bit and, and differentiate a little bit from that position that Michael just staked by saying that I do think that there's room to think about fitness in terms of best pedagogical practices. The idea that you are, you know, you're minted PhD in 1960 and you're still teaching exactly the same way, even though your student body population has changed dramatically. I think people, faculty, universities have a right to hold faculty accountable to some degree of professional development around pedagogy and best practices to create inclusive classrooms. So it, so the, in the, when you're talking about inclusive classrooms, you are oftentimes getting near questions of harm or respect or those kinds of things. And so to that extent, I'm very open to that line of argument about fitness in terms of pedagogy. Can, can I just say some one thing about harm? One of the th reasons I like your book so much is because you actually do some case studies and analyze some of the difficult contours of this. But, you know, you spend a lot of time talking about Ulrich Baer's theory behind some of this stuff, particularly, yeah. you know, I wouldn't call it extra, you know, speech related to students or invited speakers. And he talks, and I watched a panel discussion with him at Kenyon College shortly after he wrote his New, New York Times op-ed uh, about these issues and about how speakers who deny other speakers' humanities, humanity um, shouldn't be allowed a platform on campus. And mm -hmm. he, and Steven Pinker, who was there and is in the audience, has said, okay, well, let's talk about some issues. Let's talk about some cases like what is an example of a speaker, for example, who denies someone else's humanity and shouldn't be given a platform on a college campus. And his response was, I don't want to give them a platform. I don't want to even say their name here. But that poses a problem from a falsification standpoint, right? Like how do you have this sort of conversation we're having right now? It has to be a statement where someone says this group, these people are not, they're not as human as other people, there's human superiority and so on. And I can you, give you those. I, I who did you have in mind? Quote. No, like, I oh. think it's, I mean, it's fine, but then. But just for, just for understanding. I'm going to parse my, but yeah. fine, go well, ahead. Of course we have to pause it. The, that's ahead. how we would write these rules. The, the, <laughs> some topics, such as claims that some human beings are by definition inferior to others or illegal or unworthy of legal standing are not open to debate because such people cannot debate them on the same terms. Right. Okay, so. So, uh, okay. so just to, for clarification, so who would you have in mind as who, who would uh, be denying the humanity of some students? Do you want names of speakers right yeah. now? No, give it, I don't think I need to give them the platform we had here that I actually don't think they deserve. <laughs> it's a bit of a, a setup. You, you can't even, you can't even no, utter can their name names? Them. No, I absolutely can name them, but I won't. Well, but then how, how are we going to evaluate your claim if we don't even know who you're talking about? We just have to take your, your faith. You know who these people are. So that's why I like that you guys put meat on the bones in discussing this. Um, we, we imagine we, we might get sued. We, 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 you know, you have to. You have to. You can't be intimidated into silence around these issues for fear of big pockets. Yeah. At the well, same time, come talk to us if you get sued. <laughs> We'd have some fun <laughs> with that one. Um, so two more questions, if you'd let me. One. Yes. So we talk about. We talked earlier about the Brown petition to have Guy Benson, who's a capitalist, um, disinvited because capitalism is white supremacy. We talked earlier, you, you mentioned the UVA student editorial. We didn't say anything about that because we agreed with you, right? There was no threat of any sort of administrative action. Students can hold what we believe to be liberal ideas and will defend their right to say it, even if, it, their, if their ideas actuated, it would undermine everything that we work for on a day-to-day -day basis. But you, you, you both seem to find hope that there's that the next generation is going to change the interpretation of the first amendment or some of these values. And, and I wonder, you know, that's part and parcel of the question, but I worry if you are as concerned as other people are about too much ideological homo hom homogeny in, in the Academy, right? You hear Steve, you, um, uh, most cited legal, thinker there is. Uh, Cass Sunstein, for example, he does studies about how it's important to have at least one person with a minority point of view in the room. He taught, and he does it in the context of judges, right? You know, you got two judges that are conservative. They just have one liberal on the court with them. Their opinions tend to be more moderate and better engaged with the facts. And when you look at the higher education research institutes finding that uh, back 1989, 42% of faculty identified being on the left, 40% were moderate, and another 18 were on the right. Now that's 60% of faculty identified e either far left or liberal compared to just 12% being conservative. I worry, especially in the concept of composing these 
committees that you're going to, especially if that keeps trending in that direction, that you're going to get too much homogeneity within the committees. You're going to get bad decisions. The committees are going to end up, um, nobody's going to trust them because they don't think that these, and when you talk about how you structure a society, right, people need to trust that the outcomes are fair, right? And part of helping to prove that the outcomes are fair is to structure the 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 institutions in a way that build in check checks and balances for fairness. And so, you know, we talk about the next generation coming up, they're changing attitudes, potentially it's more liberal than conservative. You mentioned Professor Ruth, you know, the conservatives who are right now passing laws that restrict what can be taught in the classroom. I should say that my colleagues have spent the better part of two years fighting those successfully in almost every case, as far as it reaches into higher ed, except in Florida recently and to a certain extent in Oklahoma. But, you know, how do you think about uh, ideological homogeneity when you think about these committees and how do you avoid some, how do you structure them in a way that doesn't allow for conservatives to dismiss them. It's just a bunch of liberals on a college campus getting together and deciding what ideas can be presented and what ideas can't. I think uh, conservatives will already do that. I mean, the, uh, the rights trust in higher education is pretty much at an all-time low. And the, the if there's a hostility toward conservatives in academia, it's now pre pretty mutual. Uh, that said, that's not to dismiss the fact that it's a problem. And that in some ways, taking things internally and turning things over to the faculty, which you know the faculty might see as a gain, would be seen, I think, by some conservative groups as taking uh, the decisions out of places where they might have some leverage in administration or in the legislature or what have you. So that's a real danger. If we had written Chapter 7, we probably would have taken that on. Um, and I, I just don't know. So Jennifer and I agreed that pretty much everything – in the book would be signed Lennon McCartney, and I say that in a completely non-self-aggrandizing way. Um, but there's some total nuances here. Jennifer uh, has much more, has sort of first-hand experience with the sort of changing of the guard generationally. I do not. Uh, I don't know how that's going to fall. Um, we do have some people in the book saying, you know, critical um, race theory now is basically in the groundwater. You know, this is just what our students know. You said fluoride. It's like fluoride in the water, according to right. some people, right? It was actually put there, right? Uh -huh. um, and it was a conspiracy. But uh, <laughs> no, people really forget that, the, that, that there was a lot of conspiracy theories around putting fluoride in the water uh, back mm -hmm. when Kennedy did it. Yeah, I don't. I'm in Oregon where that battle, they successfully kept fluoride out and people's teeth are terrible. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think the not only the ideological uh, homogeneity problem, but also the possibilities of groupthink. It's interesting. Um, yeah, that's a downstream well, effect of it. And that's kind of what I was saying. Well, the, the, the grouping they can do another way as well, because you can wind up, uh, one of the criticisms we got along the way was that, look, an academic freedom committee would never fire anybody. They'd be so interested in self-protection and so in a sort of guild mentality. And that's what Jennifer was trying to register with her uh, remark that we're still turning these things over largely to white folk. And, uh, if this got, got implemented. So again, no magic bullet. But I think this is a question, uh, as, as I, I think you know well, um, not just for these committees, but for academia as a whole. Um, are there uh, sort of deformations of, of justice and judgment because you've got uh, such a, a, a tilt in certain fields? Uh, look, I'm also on record in what's liberal about the liberal arts saying, I do wish I had more conservatives in my field. Go to graduate school. It'll be hard. It was harder for women in the 70s and 80s, but come on, you do the work. Um, because I don't like it when every, there's too much taken for granted. I think Cass Sunstein's work on that is pretty much right. Yeah, and I do think to the extent that your guys' prescriptions here get framed along political lines, uh, you know, for example, the first poll quote on the back of the book, it says, uh, you know, as far as I know, this book comprises the first sustained attempt to examine the ways academic freedom and equity have been set at odds and to argue that academic freedom must be rethought and redefined along more politically progressive lines. I know those aren't your words, but, you know, that's going to raise the eyebrows. You know, so I, part of my first, when I read that. The, the thing that I think of with your question in terms of, you know, this sort of what what you you're, you're registering as are being hopeful and optimistic about the next generation, but what about concerns about homogeneity or groupthink? Um, it's a great question, and I think the way that I come at it 
is not around any particular ideology, but around processes and procedures. So for example, institutional review boards or human subjects review. Um, when there's a recent survey and the fact that the younger generation, junior faculty and graduate students uh, agreed more often than not that its central review boards are appropriate and do not overreach and the senior faculty felt like that they were bureaucratic hindrances. That to me is a good sign because it says we are going to look at, we're going to introduce more things into our analysis of whether this project is uh, humane, ethical, all of these. So it's, it's a question of what all are we looking at now and how are we making decisions around it? And the fact that the younger generation of faculty are more for those boards than, and the senior faculty are more against them. To me, that, that's, that suggests that we are moving in the right direction and we can find a way to reconcile academic freedom and equity. Or the next generation can anyway. So I've kept you both far longer than I promised I would uh, keep you. The book is fascinating. As I said, my colleagues and I discussed, they haven't read it yet. It hasn't come out yet. <laughs> um, but I recommended they all read it because I think it's one of the best arguments or the best challenges to some of the positions that we at FIRE take. And it's, it's I read this in one day and I, I usually loathe to read books that are within my field of expertise because uh, it's it's in the water. You know, I spend so much time with it. I'd much rather really? read. Spend some of it. Yeah. So, right. but this, um, you know, it, and it's because you don't just engage in the abstract. You engage with the actual cases on the ground. Uh, I will say, I think talking to you live, and this is often the case, y your hope for these committees is more tempered than I, I think I came away from in the book. And maybe mm. we can explore that uh, later. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious to see whether I encourage our readers, buy the book, read it, and let me know if you come away with the same sort of feeling after listening to this conversation and reading the book. But it's fantastic. Um, it's a fantastic refutation, I should say, in certain senses of some of the things we stand for, even though we agree, it sounds like, in certain things. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. It, it was also, thank you. Uh, and speaking of, uh, so you're the one who brought the case of Betsy Scholler to my attention at U UW uh, Milwaukee. Oh, uh, yeah. we, we had to address that as a, an example of where the faculty initially got it wrong and had to be overturned by committee. Yeah. So, well, I, you know, and I do want to add this because I know you weren't addressing this directly to me, Professor Ruth, but debates around free speech happen. One of the challenges that we have at FIRE is that it has become partisan in part because people only pay attention to them when it's on their side. You know, there was this whole, mm -hmm. there was this whole debate around cancel culture and Emma Camp, who was a former intern, wrote an op-ed in New York Times and said, this is just a conservative mm -hmm. issue. But then I went and actually looked at our cases from the last two years. And that's how I know we had 11 of them. These are that where we actively represent them and we go to court defend a lot. Of all 11 of them, it was defending liberal faculty or apolitical speech. There was not a single conservative we've gone to court to represent the last. But nobody talks about Michael Phillips at Collin College, who was fired. He was on a contractual basis. That's part of the reason why I like these faculty-led committees. Um, for advocating that Confederate monuments get taken down. Or Laura Bennett, who criticized Mike Pence's demon mouth in his debate with Oh, Kamala yeah. Harris no, or, or Klinsman at, you know, I am Antifa, you know, we are, and we take criticism because we are fairly absolutists in our position, but I right. bristle at the idea that we take a partisan approach to it. We get things wrong sometimes, but it is a, we are a very diverse staff in our cases. If anyone would just look at them are diverse well, or maybe well, even, wait a minute. I don't think I said anything. I am critical you didn't say it about of fire us. In, in a lot of respects. And I am very critical of the way in which, uh, some some academics are giving a veneer of respectability to partisan positions that are just self-interested and are pursuing either profit or votes. But I didn't. I, I, Michael and I have talked a bit, quite a bit, about how we're we're grateful to Fire in many respects. I mean, I'm specifically I'm thinking about Linfield University and um, your right. the letter you wrote just recently on behalf of Reshmi Duke Ballerstadt, uh, whose social media who's now under investigation and the pull up Pelsner thing. You guys can move faster and more aggressively in a lot of ways than academics or even an academic organization like the AAUP. Um, and we need that. What I object to is the, the sense that in the default to individual rights, because it then creates an obstacle. So for example, the R fear, you like the fact that the book names names. 
And you have to have the courage to name names. And you have to have the courage, even in the, with the fear that you'll get, you know, Coke, uh, deep pockets of Coke money will come after you in a libel suit or a civil ca- or a case. You have to be able to do that. And what I fear is that when you're championing individual rights at the expense of a sort of peer review, academic, collective decisions, you could impede change that actually is important and necessary and is the natural trajectory of a university that's not being interfered with by the outside. Yeah. I, if I had more time, I would love to have talked with you guys about the Calvin Report in the University of Chicago, because it does seem, you know, your thesis does seem to be slightly at odds with it. The idea that university is the host of critics, not critic, you know, we aren't critics are as an institution. The institution isn't critical, but, um, you know, I don't want to, did you guys have anything else you wanted to add before we sign off here? No, just to, uh, to rephrase Jennifer's response, our differences with fire have to do with, uh, again, distinctions between academic freedom and freedom of speech and the importation of the expectations of the latter into the former, but on individual cases. And I think we, we cited a bunch of them, where, uh, including the James Livingston case. Um, not only are we on the right side, but I think we're on the same side, <laughs> which happens to be the right side. But uh, we appreciate that nonpartisan status, and that's why we're not doctrinaire critics of fire. We try to take right. things, you know, um, uh, we can actually, it's, it's a curious thing, again, because of the overlap between academic freedom and extramural speech, where we can be at odds in theory in the same place in practice. Yeah. Not well, all. Yeah. I'm glad we got a chance to address that. I was waiting for a, a larger takedown of fire in the book, but you only spent about a page on us. You referenced us elsewhere, but uh, uh, the book, again, is... It's not free speech, race, democracy, and the future of academic freedom. And my guests today were Professor Michael Barabay and Jennifer Ruth. Professor Jennifer Ruth. I should have said Professors Michael Barabay and Jennifer Ruth. I appreciate you both coming on the show. And the book, again, is coming out on Tuesday, April 26th, and it'll be available hopefully wherever fine books are sold. This podcast is hosted, produced, and recorded by me, Nico Perino, and edited by my colleague, Aaron Reese. You can learn more about So To Speak by following us on Twitter at twitter.com slash free speech talk or liking us on Facebook at facebook.com slash so to speak podcast. If you have feedback for this show, please send it to so to speak at the fire.org. We'd love to hear feedback. We also love reviews. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review wherever you get your podcasts. They do help us attract new listeners to the show. And until next time, I thank you all again for listening.